10 seconds. Summary of the land use board reports. Are there any questions? Next, we'll go on to City Council report. Mr. Wooden. I'll try to be quick here this evening. Um, if you've driven by the Summersworth Fire Station, uh, that project, a uh, $9 million project, uh, is uh, close to uh, being complete. Uh, if you drive by, you'll notice some landscaping, uh, the additional final coat of asphalt, um, exterior improvements largely. Uh, interior, uh, the firefighters have moved into the recently completed section, uh, so they're operating out of the full building now. Uh, interior.
you have to stray from the podium to make your presentation, uh, we do have a portable mic you can use. When you come up again, state your name and your address or your affiliation with who you are uh, representing. Item A, Norway Plains Associates on behalf of also, Soccer Club is seeking site plan and conditional use permit approval for reconstruction of athletic fields to remove an existing baseball field and construct two soccer fields on a property located at 23. This is Map 32, Lot 6 down for the site.
I'd still like to open the public hearing. Does anybody have any comments on this application? Can you close it? Do you have any correspondence? Yeah, for sure. Um, we received an email from Thomas and Kathleen from 22 Tastebrook. I will absolutely butcher their last name, so I'm just going to say it's Thomas and Kathleen from 22 Tastebrook. Um, they sent an email to Director Mears, and they said, this email is to say that we are not against the above plan, but we do have concerns with this link about increased traffic. Tastebrook is heavily traveled at present, so the games, championships, jamborees, etc., will increase the road traffic more. They said that this league of soccer teams should have some designated people to help traffic to into ball fields, help guide parking, especially help the flow of traffic leaving the fields. We have seen some of some near miss accidents over the nine years. We hope the city planning board will lead to safe driving with good suggestions to the new soccer league using this venue. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. That's the only much questions. I uh, just wanted to give a couple of highlights from the conservation uh, discussion that we had on this. Um, the use is, is pretty low in impact, despite the fact that it is going to the buffers here. They're building soccer fields, not permanent structures. Um, so that limits the uh, overall impact on the surrounding wetlands. Uh, the majority of our requests were around uh, parking and making sure that we didn't have vehicles encroaching onto wetland areas. Uh, we asked for a couple of uh, changes on this with an earthen berm uh, off to it's the north and east of the road there, uh, which I did see on the plans. Um, placement of some boulders uh, to block off access to a few areas, uh, which were places we requested them. Um, the only other item that we had was a spot being noted on the plan for uh, directing portable uh, bathrooms on site, uh, which I did see and uh, wanted to note things that they put those pretty much as far away from the wetlands as they could and still get them on their property. Um, overall, was really responsive to our requests. Uh, looks like they incorporated all of them on the plan, and uh, we were happy to recommend them. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Any other questions from the board, Mr. Horton? Oh, I just uh, a couple of extra comments. You know, you just really reconfiguring the existing fields on this there now. Additionally, you'll have a permit, so I'm pretty confident about that, that uh, uh, will uh, support the good efforts of uh, reconfiguring the field. So uh, maybe if you just talk to the uh, uh, the abutters, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. you guys could mitigate any traffic. Thank you. Uh, I did receive one email from uh, to the, uh, I guess, the rest of the property through the woods. Um, I was kind of surprised to receive an email about this. I thought this project was uh, sort of, if you will, a slam dunk. Uh, it's athletic fields being repurposed into athletic fields. And truth be told, although it pains me greatly to see a baseball field going away, I get it. <laughs> concerns were over noise, uh, and they specifically called out spectator noise, uh, crowds cheering and that sort of thing, which in my mind I thought, well, we already have that going on out there, so this is not a new uh, configuration, if you will. Then they also raised the issue about light pollution. Uh, they were under the impression that the fields would be lit. Uh, and I said, at this time, it does not look from the plan sets that they would be lit. But I don't want to rule that out in the future. 
and then Mr. Richardson, discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Next item is uh, landscaping design standards. Uh, is there a uh, motion for that? Mr. Roots? Associates and the active process have called for determination that the existing landscaping meets the intent of the landscaping design standards be approved. Motion made by Mr. Woods. Second by Mr. Woodley. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Next, we'll climb into the waiver request. Sorry, I'm not sure which, um, what's your question? Which waiver it is. So you're seeking a waiver for, uh, section 10.2 specifications for plans and documents to be submitted. Oh, is that this traffic study? Is that correct? There's a traffic study waiver. Yeah, I see it now. Yeah. Okay, I'm good there. All set. Any other questions? Okay, waiver number one, specifications for plans and documents to be submitted. Anybody have a motion for the waiver? Mr. Whitten. Sure, I move that the request of Norway Plains Associates on behalf of Rosso Soccer Club for a, wave, for a waiver from Section 10.2 uh, regarding a traffic study be approved. Motion by Mr. Whitten, seconded by Mr. Whitten. Discussion. Mr. Whitten. Yeah, I always think it's important if we're going to waive our requirements just to give a little bit of background as to why I would support that. Uh, as has been articulated by both their uh, Norway Plains representative and Mr. Hill, uh, these fields have been there for uh, a long, long time. Uh, the traffic impacts are known. Uh, we, it's a measurable uh, quantity that comes and goes. Uh, doesn't appear to be excessive by any stretch, so uh, I am fine with the waiver request. Any further discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Those? Waiver passes. Waiver number two, section 12. Point four, point A, point B, Exhibit A, non-residential developments required parking spaces to allow 68 parking spaces with 117 is required. Does anybody have a motion? Mr. Horton. We have to request an online plan associate on behalf of Rosa Circuit Club for a letter from Section 1245, Exhibit A, and site plan review regulations to be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton. Second by Mr. Barry. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Waiver number three, section 12.4.B.VI, vehicular circulation and parking, parking lot design standards, all parking lots, driveways, and all shall be paved. So you have a motion for waiver. And so, Mr. Whittle. Yes, I move that the request for this waiver from section 12.4.B.6, the site plan regulations, be approved. Motion made by Mr. Whittle. Second by Mr. Rhodes. Discussion. Mr. Wooden. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a gravel parking lot right now. I have taken note um, sometime recently here uh, that a bit of a paved apron was provided off of Kate's Brook Road, uh, which I very much appreciate that, that being taken care of. I would have made that a condition here, if not just to preserve the road edge. But that's been done, so I'm good. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Waiver number four, section 12.4.D.7, vehicular circulation, parking, traffic impact, electric vehicle, EV charging stations. So a motion for a waiver from this item. Mr. Rhodes. With the request of Norway Plains Associates on behalf of Rosa Soccer Club for a waiver from 12.4.D.7 of the site plan review uh, regulations requirement to install electric vehicle, char vehicle charging stations be approved. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes, seconded by Mr. Richardson. Discussion, Mr. Whitten. Uh, congratulations. I don't know if it's a prize, but I believe this is the first waiver from this requirement as it's a relatively new requirement. So, there you go. Any further discussion? All 
those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Labor is granted. Labor number five from section 4.19. Interparty review, third party review of the drainage report. Does anybody have a motion for the labor? Mr. Horton. I would like to request my right plan associates on behalf of those who sought care for the labor from section 12.19 of the site plan regulations requires to have a drainage report, third party review, and be approved. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes, second by Mr. Rhodes. Discussion. Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Well, before we go on to the commission, I use for that uh, director. Excuse me. <laughs> So the Conservation Commission provided the following conditions of approval. Um, there shall be a barrier along the west side of the parking lot to act as a barrier to protect the wetlands, uh, such as rocks. An earth and grass berm installed along the east side of the driveway to protect the wetlands. If invasive plantings are found on site, all fill shall remain on site. There shall be no further disturbance to the tree line undergrowth other than what is shown on the plan. Final plan shall bear the stamp of the wetland scientist. The applicant shall provide the location of the pro parties. These shall be located outside of the wetland buffer. That's good. Thank you. Entertain a motion. Mr. Rhodes, I would the request of Norwood Plains Associates Incorporated on behalf of Russell Soccer Club for a conditional use permit for 8,225 square feet impact to the recurring and wetland buffer as a part of a recreational field development be approved with the conditions as laid out by NATO. Motion by Mr. Rhodes, second by Mr. Gordon. Discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, motion for the CUP. Water use ordinance in city sewer as applicable. 
um, conditions applicable during and after construction. Uh, there shall be new signage added um, indicating the park entrance installed as per any of you. Yeah, I will. Anyone who wants to apply a park entrance ahead sign shall be installed for both approaches to the park to the satisfaction of the city's public works department. Okay. Both approaches at the cost of the applicant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there should be no wetland degradation during construction. Uh, completed stormwater inspection maintenance logs submitted annually um, on or before July 1st. All landscaping shown on the plan shall be maintained. Any dead or dying vegetation shall be replaced in a timely manner. I, based off your discussion, I had, there was a condition that any outdoor lighting, including security lights, shall be downlit and shielded so no direct light is visible from adjacent properties. And there was discussion that if they install, would this just be for field lighting that you want them to come back? Okay. So we'll keep that downlit and shielded, but include a condition that says, if the applicant proposes to install any field lighting, they shall come back to the board for review of the lighting plan. And then this project will require ads votes. And that is all the conditions have. It's a point of order. Uh, it says they see a proposal, but this is actually a site plan motion. Just to confuse you, yes. <laughs> it is a site plan motion. <laughs> Anybody have a motion? Yes, Mr. I move that the request of Bowman Plains Associates on behalf of Rosa Soccer Club for the site plan approval for reconstruction of athletic fields to remove an existing ball field and construct two soccer fields be approved with the conditions as defined by Ms. Crossley. Motion made by Mr. Berry, second by Mr. Rhodes. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Site plan is approved. Thank you. Item B, under new business. Jill Fazon, 12-month LLC, seeking a waiver of subdivision regulation requirement of Chapter 22, Section Number 7, for reduction in bond requirement for street acceptance for property located at Villages at Sunningdale Drive in a residential single-family R1 district assistance map 20, Lot 5, Site Number 08-2023. At this point, Mr. Hayden, did you want to... Yes, sir. I need to refuse for item number four B. Item four, do you have anything to add? I'm sorry. Um, so the Sunningdale subdivision is in the process of working towards petitioning the city for street acceptance. As part of this process, the subdivision regulations require the applicant to provide the following for street acceptance. P acceptance, the acceptance of the maintenance bond or other security as outlined in section O may be pre a precondition to acceptance of the street by the City Council. O, improvement guarantees, a surety bond or other form of security to cover maintenance of roads and other improvements for a period of two years from the date of completion in an amount not less than 25% of said cost of improvements. If repair or unusual maintenance is necessary or if, any, or if additional improvements are required, then such costs as are deemed necessary by the City Engineer shall be drawn against the said charity. The applicant has submitted a waiver request from the requirement to provide 25% of the cost of improvements for the surety bond to be held two years. They have submitted a proposal to maintain the existing $202,646 bond that will remain in place. This would, bond would need to be updated to reflect the appropriate things to cover, so it would not necessarily be a performance bond, it would be need to be either updated or replaced to be the um, appropriate maintenance bond for this purpose. But at this point, I believe the project is able to be discussed by the board. Thank you. I'm a motion for application acceptance. Mr. Horton. I've got the application of Joe Falzoni of 12-month LLC. 
Russia has played. First one, Mr. Logan. Second one, Mr. Richardson. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? This time, I'd like to invite Mr. Phil Zoman to uh, make his presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. This was a five-phase project over a six-plus and minus-year process. And um, in that process, uh, two of the phases, for some reason, no one knows, I don't know, the people doesn't know, our board that we posted just carried over to the next phase. Since then, uh, after supplying information, we reached a, a total bargain figure of uh, had those two then approved of approximately $3.9 million, which results in a uh, you know, of 25% and $960,000 or $70,000 performance bond. Um, as I got to the last phase, I had asked uh, the deputy governor, uh, I was working with Mike, if I could pave the prior phases, because I always try to get to the top curve, because there's a whole period of two years on the bond. I was asked not to do that, because they were concerned about traffic for the last phase that was off the main loop. And, and I agreed to, uh, to do that, because it made logical sense, and the less traffic, the better. However, I wasn't thinking at the time that had I gone forward, the only 25% of the person is on the last loop, which would have been for a bargain amount of less than what I had proposed in 202. One of the things the board asked me to do that is not in their regulations, as uh, the Delta Amendment said, we know, was to do a camera exploring of the drainage, the water, uh, the sewer pipes throughout the whole project, which was $21,000. It wasn't required, it's not in the regulation, it made sense, I did it. And they did find one section on Sunnyvale underground, they had an issue, so they had to come in and they fixed it. Um, so, so the bone amount right now uh, is excessive uh, for the reasons that I've, I've stated. Um, the planning department went out and looked at surrounding towns and came up with one amount like between 2% and 10%. Uh, for those reasons, uh, I'm asking because I'm allowed to ask if it could be reduced as proposed. Because everything underground is fine. Anything that happens underground would have to be real quick for it to be $950,000 worth of damage. It's not only really the pavement and the carbon that could get damaged on the two week period. And that is my case. Okay. Thank you. This time I'd like to uh, have the public hearing and ask if there's anybody from the public that just comment on this item. Okay, I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. All right. And you now um, was received on July 19th, uh, the site to Director Brzezinski and Director Mears, um, from uh, Mark Gallagher, about 47 minutes ago. Mark Gallagher indicates we are still, we are still experiencing extreme poverty and pollution on our property. 47 minutes ago, so it's right. Telephone policy has never contacted us. We are attempting to alleviate water flow from properties above us on the river circle. We see most recent picture, pictures attached. Telephone policy should not be relieved by the any of drainage issues of the villages of Sunnyville have been completely resolved. Thank you for your attention on this matter. Please remain in place. And we do have some comments that were submitted with this email. We can pass them on to the board member. Okay. That is the only written comment I see. Thank you. 
Questions from here.
Item C, Winchester Arms LLC is seeking a lot line adjustment between two properties located along Route 108, Commercial Drive, and the Commercial Industrial CI District. This is map 41, lot 9, map number 64, lot 1, sub number 02-2023. Lena Crossley, you have anything to add? Um, the proposed lot line adjustment adjusts the property boundaries to be in line with the municipal boundary between Summersworth and Dover. The overall impact of this lot line adjustment will not be seen in Summersworth side of the property boundaries. Um, as you can see on the attached uh, maps we provided in your packet along with the lot line adjustment, there's a, um, in 2017 and 18, the subject properties went through a lot line adjustment. And as part of that, there was a sliver of land for the Summersworth parcels that remained in Dover. This application will clean up that lot line by transferring the remaining land in Dover mm -hmm. to the properties owned by Winchester Arms and bringing the new property boundaries to the municipal boundary. So you can see the previous subdivision plan. There's a little highlighted orange area. That area is going to remain in Dover. And basically, the Summersworth properties will look the same as they do now. Thank you. This time, I'll ask Mr. Bruton to make his uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is FX Bruton. I'm with Bruton and Barraby in Dover. Happy to be back here. I haven't seen you in a long time. Um, this is fairly straightforward, I think. Um, with me tonight is Gary Campbell, and he's the representative of R Winchester Arms. Uh, Kevin McEnany is here as well, a uh, surveyor uh, from Dover, and uh, he helped us with the plans that you see here. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, as Dana mentioned, this was originally uh, a lot line adjustment that uh, was approved by this board and Dover because it straddled the line. Um, and what happened was uh, basically my client, Winchester Arms, was not part of that uh, uh, lot line adjustment. It was just an abutter. And the Garabedian lot, which uh, most people would know is that large lot that is still unused uh, and uh, a portion of the lot that's owned by the city of Dover, <coughs> there was a lot line adjustment and on that plan it was referred to as parcel B. And uh, what they used at the time was a, um, uh, an older plan that depicted what was supposed to be the existing lot line. Um, then there was some clarity with respect to the town lines and long story short, um, the Garabini convey parcel B to the city of Dover. Uh, and then when my client was looking at uh, just internal housekeeping in terms of where his land was and what was depicting it, um, we came across the uh, lot line adjustment and noticed that that sliver that you see that actually Dana thankfully carved out because it's a little bit difficult here on the plan that is actually the plan itself, and I can show you show it to you very quickly. But in any event, that sliver uh, is what was, in a sense, uh, uh, referenced, but uh, was not referencing the actual town line. And so the city of Dover and the Garabedian Trust uh, and Winchester Arms are coming now to kind of, in a sense, set the record straight but define where that property line should be. Because that land was conveyed by the Garabedians to the city of Dover, the city of Dover, who is a co-applicant right in front of us, um, has agreed to take that little sliver that was conveyed to them and convey it back to Winchester Arms just so that the title is fine. It doesn't really relate to you guys. Uh, but in any event, all of that land was, when it came before you, that actual soil, if you will, was in Dover uh, and it will remain in Dover and nothing's changed about 
the city property line, uh, other than we now have clarity of where it is. Uh, so this is all in an attempt to just kind of uh, recognize that line and make that minor adjustment and all parties are willing to do it and um, happy to do it. So uh, that's the simplicity of it. The reason this plan looks a little bit different than what Dana has provided to you and what I mean by that is the Winchester Arms parcel looks like it's one lot, but if you look closely, uh, it was dis described as lots 18 through 18E. And what we have depicted is that that one lot was is really, I don't know, six or seven lots. So when you see your plan in front of you now, um, that's 18 through 18E. It's just on that plan it wasn't defined. And we wanted it to be defined because we have to... Um, reference each of those little chunks of that triangle just for real estate purposes. Um, so that's the plan you have in front of you, but the one Dana gave you is actually the best in terms of the overall concept of what we're doing. So I appreciate your patience and listening to all that. If you have any questions of us, we're happy to answer them. And again, keep in mind the city of Dover is actually one of your applicants tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one little housekeeping item. Uh, uh, entertain a motion for application acceptance. Mr. Rhodes? So motion made by Mr. Rhodes, seconded by Mr. Witham. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Open the public hearing. Anybody from the public care to comment on this item? Plan Crossley, any correspondence? No correspondence. Seeing none, close the public hearing. Questions from the board? Mr. Witham. Good to have you back, Mr. Bruton, although this is relatively boring. So, uh, but needed, I understand. Important. So. <laughs> Straightforward. <laughs> any other questions? Entertain a motion for regional impact. Mr. Rhodes. At the uh, risk of absurdity, I move that the lot line adjustment application of Winchester Arms LLC for a lot line adjustment does not have potential for regional impact. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes, second by Mr. Berry. Discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, uh, Planner Crossley, care to uh, review conditions? <laughs> Um, no plan revisions proposed. Um, conditions that, be, that must be met prior to final approval. Um, final plan shall bear stamp and signature of the engineer and licensed land surveyor. Um, we would also request a PDF copy of the final recorded plans um, to be emailed, shared with us via email um, for tax map update purposes, though this will have no impact of our tax maps. Um, and then monumentation. Um, granite bounds at any streets, which this does not have, but at property corners, which do not have public right of way bounds as approved by the board, shall be installed. And a surveyor is to submit a signed letter to the planning department stating that the new lot corner monuments have been set prior to the plans being recorded. And that is all. Thank you. Entertain a motion, Mr. Witham. Yeah, I'd move that the request of Winchester Arms LLC for the lot line adjustment between properties located along Route 108 and Commercial Drive be approved. Motion made by Mr. Witham, second by Mr. Horton. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you kindly. Have a good night. You're welcome. Thank you. Item D, under new business, Brittany Lee, on behalf of Summersworth Rail Station, is seeking a site plan amendment for a waiver of parking space requirements for a property located at 400 High Street in the Residential Commercial RC District, Assessors Map 37, Lot 4, Site Number 11, 2023. Plan across, Lee Cato. Yep. 
Um, so 400 High Street was developed in 2005 um, for an 8,400 commercial retail building providing um, 38 parking spaces. Um, we included the site plan sheet for that um, in your packet and the break that includes the breakdown of how parking was calculated. Um, the site was developed with five commercial spaces and the following are existing tenants along with the parking requirements for the use as per the site plan review regulations. Dunkin' Donuts, um, a 21,000, yep, 2,100 square foot um, with drive-through requires 21 spaces. Edward Jones Investments, a 1,050 square foot space requires 4.2 spaces. Miracle Ear, a 1,050 square foot um, space requires again 4.2 spaces. And the restaurant, a 2,100 square foot, 40 chairs, three employees per the CO of the last record that we have, requires 15.33 spaces. So the applicant is proposing to add a retail use in the existing fifth vacant space, um, which is 1,950 square feet unit and would require 9.75 parking spaces based off of the square footage. This requires, um, with the coast bus stop reduction, a total space of 49.03 spaces required for the site. The applicant is seeking a waiver from section 12.4.V, Exhibit A, to provide less than the required number of spaces for the existing uses. They're proposing to keep the existing 38 parking spaces to support their existing businesses and the new business in their vacant space. Um, please note, vehicular circulation and parking does note that applicants are encouraged to utilize less than the required parking spaces shown in Exhibit A as long as adequate information is submitted that supports less parking for the proposed development. Um, at this time, the application is full for the board to take forward to discuss. Contain motion for application acceptance. Mr. Witham. Move for its acceptance. Second. Motion made by Mr. Witham, seconded by Mr. Barry. Discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Application is accepted. This time I'd like to invite uh, Brittany Lee representatives to make the presentation I am not Brittany uh, Lee Joseph Pellich uh, for Summersworth Rail Station tonight um, thank you so much um, for your consideration so the the proposed use uh, would be called um, it's a DBA it's the beer and wine station it's a specialty beer store with over 500 types of beer it's a special permit um, in New Hampshire that you get from the state a relatively rare um, those type of stores. Uh, there'll be wine as well with a, a broad uh, selection and a big humidor, um, custom built in North Carolina and shipped up. Um, so it's it's hopefully going to be a high-end um, use. Uh, recently, um, there was a change of tenant, so I think lots of you probably knew Old Rail uh, Pizza. Old Rail Pizza is uh, not in business uh, any longer. And it switched, and right now we're just working on a very high-end Italian restaurant, very small, um, and um, limited uh, seats. And uh, in essence, the bar was a lot for that space. Great place, but uh, probably not adequate parking for, for how many um, people would visit there. So that is no longer there. We think this is a great balance. We'll only need, generally speaking, one or two employees. So we literally only need one or two spots for this use with a bigger uh, a bigger store and um, I think from my understanding from the um, gentleman who's going to lease it is no more than three so perhaps during Christmas season or other holidays they may have a third person on staff but generally it's a, a super quick turnaround people come in generally less than five minutes for for a, a trip they pick out their specialty beer and and they move on so there's nothing served on site there's no anything like that simply just purchase uh, the specialty item and, and um, move on so so far in 16 plus years you know we haven't found this good of a use to be quite honest from a parking perspective um, and struggled for 16 years to fill that one spot it's been vacant for 16 years and in essence long story long-term lease with that restaurant became a bar uh, the bar use was just not appropriate for you know what a tenant saw as you know their parking needs so the second that we um, didn't resign their lease 
Uh, we get lots of activity, and we had this person come forward right away. They're from New York, I believe, uh, but they have stores in Maine and New Hampshire and, and New York and perhaps even New Jersey. Um, and they found out that we are going to do this really high-end Italian concept, and they thought it would be a perfect pairing uh, next door with a small, quaint Italian restaurant, which, by the way, uh, generally I think is going to open around 5. I think that's a really important point because, as we all know, Duncan's is super busy early in the morning. It goes through almost no traffic at all around 10, 10.30, 11, picks up a bit for lunch. By 3 o'clock, that parking lot is generally empty in that area. Edward Jones leaves around 4, 4.30. Miracle Air, same. So the parking lot is really great at night. Um, and this kind of balances those uses out. So we hope that we can get your support. Um, All right, thank you. Thank you. Open public hearing. Any comments from visitors? Lana Crosley, any correspondence? No written submitted correspondence. Seeing none, close public hearing. Questions from the board? Mr. Witham, then Mr. Berry. Thank you. I do think this is a reasonable request. I think the applicant did a very good job at articulating sort of the types of tenants there. I was not aware of all the details with Old Rail and now this new uh, restaurant, so thank you for that. Um, and when I look at Dunkin' Donuts, that's a morning and maybe a bit of a lunch business, but it tapers off pretty quick, right? So when we talk in our site plan regulations about consideration of fewer parking spaces. This is exactly what was intended, this sort of shared spaces, right? So uh, I think this works in this particular uh, situation. So I'm in support of it. However, a couple of concerns with, with the site that I think are relevant to the parking that I, I would just like to, to flag here. One, uh, the parking lot lighting uh, does not seem operable at the moment so it needs to be repaired, so that would be a condition that I'd, I'd like to see. If we're going to have a, a vibrant business at night, we need to make sure that that parking lot is well lit. Um, in addition, there's some exterior lights for the sign at the corner of Stackpole Road that have fallen into disrepair. One of them points out in the traffic, so I'd like to tie that in as uh, needing repair uh, as well. Um, and uh, thirdly, uh, I think the parking lot striping could use a refresh, and I'd like to add that. And if we're going to be sharing spots, we need to make sure that they're well delineated. So uh, those would be my three requests of the applicant, which I think are just good to do anyways. Absolutely. So, so with regard to all of the above, so the, the parking lot and the building are overlet relative to the original plan. So we have a lot. We did a lot of wall packs uh, around the building, obviously because of the drive through was the big safety concern. Um, the front lights we've had a lot of problems with. Uh, they get hit regularly, um, and they are on order right now. So we've ordered the three new lamps for the big custom poles. Um, so that shouldn't be a problem. I'm not sure about the one, the, the sign in the front. I was unaware that there was a problem. I think we'll eliminate the light because it gets hit. Um, and it's probably getting being hit by a snow plow would be yeah, my guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we've repaired it pr in previous years, but uh, it also, I think, Pedestrians sometimes will break it, perhaps, or something. But anyway, w we have no problem with that condition at all, uh, and we planned on striping the parking lot anyway. Mr. Berry. Yeah. Um, first things first. Um, very happy about the uh, the clients that are coming into your building, and I'll, I know my wife and I were very excited about trying out the new restaurant, and I'm overjoyed to hear about your beer and wine client come moving in as well. Um, now, as far as the, you know, you stole my thunder in regards to the mixed use and how traffic comes in. I was going to say the same thing. You know, Dunkin' Donuts in the morning, mid-morning, little around lunch is going to be busy. But keep in mind, the majority of that traffic also goes through the back of the building through the drive through um, But as the day progresses, you're going to start seeing your cars move towards the other side of the building. So that's really great. Um, but even in my experience driving around there, I don't recall... Uh, the, tr the parking lot ever being truly full, ever. May maybe one time, and as long as I've been here in 10 years. So um, I have no problem supporting the request that you have. The one other thing that I would also mention, in addition to Councillor Witham, is the entrance coming in from the Walmart side. Uh, I call it the, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a tank, uh, tank hunter pothole on the entrance, if that could also be addressed as well. We'd love safety. to, but it's the cities. So we've been told not to touch it. 
Um, it's happened for years and years. Unfortunately, there's a hydrant right there. Mm -hmm. It's perhaps the depth of the water is cl very close to the four feet or so, uh, and you'll always get frost heaves there. So generally, the city will come around this time and they'll fill that in. Uh, I agree. We did fix it ourselves lots of times. We're told that's the that's the road. Don't touch our road. Um, uh, I think right. it was DPW who came down and talked to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's an easy fix. It's just a big, big old pothole, right? No doubt about it. As you come in, is yeah. I've almost, I'm almost fallen victim to that a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. So, so noted. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, and okay, I can't, I, I can't make that a condition of approval, but certainly I'm going to aim towards the city guys. Fix it, please. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's bad, uh, but certainly all of the, uh, the recommendations that Councilor Witham put forward, I'd like to see also put into the approval conditions. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Thank you. Uh, so my comments are pretty similar to what have been said already. Um, I think we we know that uh, Dunkin' Donuts tapers off pretty quick, so I think there's mixed use and parking there. But really, my heartburn is with the entrance on High Street, yeah. uh, specifically the island right there. It's it's a odd shape. It doesn't fit there. It just doesn't. It, it makes for getting in and out of that main entrance pretty tough. So. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be in favor of uh, demo it, patch it, paint it, whatever you got to do. Have a painted island there, or delineation, or anything to that effect. So, so that was part of um, the original condition when we got the approval in 2005. Uh, we tried not to build it. We didn't. Um, and the city demanded that we build it. They want the traffic to come really, really slow as they pull it off of High Street. I couldn't agree with you more. I've seen more cars rip their exhausts off going over it. We painted it yellow. We had a sign in it. They run the sign over. It's generally a problem. But I think from a planning and an engineering perspective, um, that's something that the city absolutely wanted. I'll do so whatever, I'd, I'll I'd do whatever the city wants, but they made us put it back in. I'd be in favor of adding, adding that as a condition of approval as well for the demo uh, of that granite cribbon island. Uh, and uh, just pave over it, and if necessary, delineate with striping when the paving, when the parking lot is really striped. That's great. That's excellent. I guess one of my questions was, wasn't that part of the original site plan approval? So I don't know if, whether you can make that a condition to change it. Got a whack at the pinata here tonight, I guess. <laughs> so I'm curious. Would it, could this be an opportunity for the city to look at the uh, the pothole and go into the the zone that he's not allowed to touch? Would the city be amenable to that? That's just a general question. Uh, probably aimed towards DPW, I would suppose. Mr. Richardson, been waiting. <laughs> yeah, on the same thing. It, it's kind of. It's kind of a narrow entrance, but I do think that the island delineates the right-hand turn coming in from those who are turning right to go out, mm -hmm. uh, where without that little island, I, I can see some conflict there between cars going out and cars coming in. Um, it's also been part of, that island has also been part of the, the degradation caused by uh, all the other problems there, too, because sometimes that's been crumbled and whatever else and it, it it's a problem and I, I I've wondered how to fix that but I but I also think it prevents accidents from happening going out and coming in so I, I'm I'm kind of mixed on that whole thing there but uh, maybe it is something worthwhile for the city to review at some point but uh, I don't think it's something that you need to be responsible for the city made you do it so I think it's something on our end. So. Twice, we did it. We did do it twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Witham, then Mr. Horton. I think I generally favor removal of the island. So the city made me do it. The city made him do it because it was a condition of approval. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it was just this out of a whim. So conditions of approval are put in place by this board. I would gather that conditions of approval can be modified by this board when we have an opportunity like tonight. So it's an ideal opportunity to have the discussion. A condition of approval would be removal of the traffic island. If I recall correctly, and it was way back in my early years as a planning board member, uh, the reason for that 
traffic island, there was a fair amount of concern about people leaving the high street entrance and turning left and going towards Dover. The intent of the island was to, and it has that funny shape, was to funnel people right to head towards downtown. Observation is a good indicator of behavior. So if you were to park a lawn chair on the front lawn there and watch cars leave the establishment, yes, some turn right. Many turn left, despite what the traffic island is suggestive of. They'll drive over it, they'll drive around it. Uh, so its intended purpose isn't meeting the mark. Let's just say that, right? Uh, people don't want to go out on the Stackpole Road and get in a light queue. This seems quicker for them. Uh, so they choose to do that. Um, the big pothole by that fire hydrant when you turn in, I'll suggest that that's exacerbated by the fact that it's a very narrow entrance. It's a narrow throat. So when you have a somewhat larger vehicle, a big SUV, a pickup truck, uh, that sort of thing, your tires are going to be over the edge of hot top and it just beats on that edge. So. Removal of the traffic island might help that issue a bit. Uh, I, I, I don't think the traffic island meets its intended purpose. It's a maintenance nightmare. Um, I think you could delineate in and out with appropriate striping. Uh, I kind of like the idea of its removal because I think it, it doesn't work there is my observation. Mr. Horton, Mr. Rhodes? Just a, yeah, I agree completely. I was just going to add to I think the, the island there causes more problems than it prevents. And, and that's why I'd like to uh, see that removed. Mr. Rhodes. Uh, just to add my voice into the debate around the island and the, the property in, in general, um, the parking lot sight lines at, and turns in this property are very tight. And the worst spot is that island. Um, if you drive a vehicle that's a little bit higher up off the ground or one with relatively poor sight lines, and I drive both with a Toyota FJ, um, you just avoid that entrance entirely because you're going to hit the curb you can't see it you're going to hit that pothole which if you're driving something that's built for off-road conditions and it shakes your spine every time you go over it it's an indication it's very bad i think it is exacerbated by that island i'd be in favor of getting rid of that island entirely i stick to the stack pole entrance on this property every time i go in or out specifically for that reason um, it's not modifying behavior the way it was supposed to in the first place it's causing problems it's degrading the road and I think people are likely to slow down more when they're facing the side of another car than they are for an island they can barely see. Mr. Haven. Yeah, I, I agree as well as getting rid of the island, but I'm also contemplating making an ent entrance only. And that's what my thought is. That may be a safer idea than having it go in and out, make it an entrance only. Mr. Berry? Um, yeah, you read my mind, exactly. So I guess the question, I think everybody in general is okay with this idea of removing the island. Um, the question is, you, you didn't come for that tonight, right? You don't have an engineering stamp saying, here's what we're gonna do. So a conversation I think we need to have is how, how do we get the applicant to where we need him to be? Um, because we're, we're imposing this on him. So is, is it fair for us to say, go and get an engineer to design this thing, or can we work it out with city staff? We've gone a bit off course. <laughs> <laughs> exactly the point. <laughs> um, I, c I cannot really indicate either way whether or not I could have this put on city staff to do that or not it would be something I would have to run through director Mears and director Babinski um, to ask the yeah as Ms. Council Witham's indicating kind of a no um, as for having the applicant come back with engineered things I would say the applicant is seeking a waiver from the parking requirement at this point if he desires to come back for a site plan amendment that has if you're looking for and if to make that decision about the curbing island if you need engineered plans and a stamped engineered I think that you can inform the applicant of that and then make the decision on the parking waiver that he's asking and let them know that if he desires to remove that curbing he can come back with further plans for that 
You could also ask for, if you want to keep the intent but don't want the curbing, could ask for signage that says no left-hand turns. I don't know if there is existing signage that says that. So I, I would be pleased to remove that, to be quite honest. <laughs> but, I, but because of timing, it's a, that's a nightmare. It causes accidents. Like anyone who's been in and out knows that. I would love it if there was an ability to vote on this tonight. I don't want to be pushy, but they love, we poured the floor today. We pulled a building permit, uh, you know, not to be presumptuous that we're going to get the waiver, but some use has to go there. Yeah. I, I think um, other than the initial ones regarding the island, could, would it be possible to have a condition in there if the applicant uh, would like to remove the uh, traffic island at High Street? Uh, which the planning board generally supports that that could be handled as a minor field modification with city staff Which doesn't require coming back here. It's it's an administrative process uh, and, I, and I've had a great experience with the city for years all the way from Dave Sharples forward. So um, If I, I'd be very happy to take the island out particularly with miracle Ear. generally people are a bit older some really old and, it, and they do get hung up there, and it, it, I think it does cause problems. I have no problem. It's very inexpensive to take it out. It's not an economic thing. It would make them all a better place. So I assure this board I'd love to work with staff to get rid of it if, if there's a way mechanically or legally to do that. Mr. Rhodes, Mr. Horton, and then Mr. Richardson. So I think Mr. Whittem got what I was going to say. We've got kind of three things here. There's the parking request, which I think we're all in favor of, given the timing items. There's the island, which sounds like we can deal with through minor field modifications. And then there's the pothole, which we have noted is a DPW issue and we want to poke them about. Um, so in terms of what we've got here, I think we can only deal with the parking tonight, apart from an encouragement to come back and a positive response to getting rid of that island across the board. Mr. Horton. Uh, my comments uh, as well. Um, I'm in favor of the uh, waiver for parking. Uh, additionally, we have the lighting concerns, and uh, perhaps uh, I think that's probably a great suggestion to, to handle it at the um, uh, SRTC and, and maybe note that this board is all in favor as well. I, I, I think the lighting, the striping is relevant to the parking, so that could be a point condition too. here. Good, I, I like that too. So I would be in favor of keeping that as condition. Mr. Richardson. Yeah, I think, you know, Dave's hit it right on the head. Um, lighting, striping, and signage, I think, uh, would help. Um, certainly turning right is okay. I, I, I avoid that entrance either in or out. I, I come from Stackpole Road. I'm more than happy to enter the queue at the light uh, just for safety reasons all the way around. But you know, I can't imagine somebody turning, trying to turn left out of that where it curves to the right. And so then you kind of got to go zigzag your way out there, Zigzags which is, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think the SRT level is, is certainly capable of coming up with a, with a solution. It's, it, it's not good as it is right now, so. Agreed. Any other questions or comments from the board? With that, is there a motion? I'll take a stab, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Witham. I move that the request of Brittany Lee on behalf of Summersworth Rail Station for a waiver from Section 12.4.5, Exhibit A of the Site Plan Regulations to provide 38 parking spaces where 49.03 are required be approved with the conditions that the uh, parking lot lighting uh, be repaired and be operational, uh, that the existing pavement line striping be redone, and that the line, uh, the lights for the uh, pedestal sign either be repaired or removed. Motion made by Mr. Witham, seconded by Mr. Rhodes. Discussion? Mr. Horton. Can we amend the, uh, the motion to include removal of the island? I'll make an amendment that the traffic island, uh, rec removal of the traffic island is recommended by the board and that it be handled as a minor field modification with city staff. I like Should that. Restated by Mr. Witham, second by Mr. Rhodes. Further discussion? 
All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Motion passes. Waiver granted. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for getting rid of the island. It was, I mean, I mean that sincerely. It was. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. You as well. This is Christmas in July. <laughs> Item E, Dylan Glover is seeking a conceptual review for a motor vehicle services use located at 40 Main Street in the Business B District Assessors Map 11, Lot 204, Site Number 10, 2023. Linda Crossley, anything to add? Um, so this is a conceptual review. Um, so it, it, there's no action required by the board. It's just a discussion with this potential applicant. They are looking to establish a motor vehicle repair garage station at 40 Main Street. This property is located in the special parking overlay, which does not require on-site parking. It is 0.19 acres, and the previous use was a professional service. Um, it's also located in the form-based codes overlay, and as per section 1932E3 uses, where uses are not specifically called out in the permitted use table, an applicant may submit a conditional use permit for the proposed use. So should the applicant come forward with that use, they would also need a conditional use permit. And, but this is an opportunity for the board to discuss the use with the applicant. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite the applicant to make their presentation. Perfect. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Dano. I'm a commercial real estate agent uh, with SVN, the Masiello Group. I represent the owner of the property, Let Realty Group. Um, Let Realty Group um, reach, recently purchased the property in November of 22 from Daynu LLC. On February 5th of this year, I was hired to lease the property. Um, we ran into a, a lot of interest, but uh, had some trouble leasing it to you know general business uses that are uh, called out in the use table. Um, we met with uh, Dylan, who had expressed interest in using it uh, for auto use. It is my understanding that it was used for an auto use for many years, and that the previous uh, use from the seller was a flooring-related business. Um, while I was at the property earlier today, we located their previous um, use permit, which Though said flooring, I do have it here somewhere, uh, was called out as an auto use. Um, I will, I can pass that around. The, as you see in the staff report, uh, 40 Main Street is located in the form based codes overlay district. Uh, motor vehicle repair garage stations are not listed as a permitted use, but per 1932E3, uh, where not specifically called out in the permitted use table, we may submit a conditional use permit. Um, so that's, we're, we're here to kind of, you know, see what you guys think of an auto use in this location. With that, I'll call up uh, Dylan to talk about his business. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dylan Glover. I live right here in Summersworth at 7 Emory Street and I am the owner of Glover's Garage, LLC. We are a mobile garage. We have one truck with tools and equipment to fix vehicles and equipment, small and large. We are looking to permanently settle into 40 Main Street and use that as our home base and repair facility for equipment we cannot service mobily. I have been a mechanic for approximately 13 years. I have worked most of my career for a Boston-based construction company uh, Barletta Engineering Corporation. There I worked on uh, road race cars, <laughs> uh, heavy equipment, rail equipment, generators, and small engines. Uh, I did one year of training at Mercedes-Benz of Boston where I repaired and serviced Mercedes-Benz vehicles. I went to school at Universal Technical Institute where I studied automotive and diesel technology. I also completed a six-month training at Mercedes-Benz Elite Advanced uh, where I learned just about every nook and cranny of Mercedes-Benz vehicles, engines, and drivetrains. My hope is to take my business to the next level right here in Summersworth. 
I plan to use the building as a repair facility for automotive service and repair for equipment I am unable to service on the road. I will only park probably less than five vehicles uh, maximum in the parking lot and will not need to change the exterior of the building in any way. The building location and the community is the ideal location for this new endeavor and I hope this committee can share this vision by approving the change of use for the property at 40 Main Street. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. So, thank you, Dylan. Um, as you know, the conditional use permit process is very lengthy and expensive for applicants. Uh, we received engineering quotes in excess of $25,000 to do full site plan approval. Um, essentially, we would like to see what we can waive from the engineering um, as needed, as we believe strict conformity would pose an undue hardship and the specific circumstances relative to the site plan or conditions of the land in such site plan indicate the waiver will carry out the spirit and intent of the regulation. Uh, this property is completely paved. There are no areas for landscaping, no wetlands to delineate. Uh, drainage will stay as is. The building is not moving, so no setbacks or changing traffic impact would be negligible. Um, we believe that the city has adequate capacity for sewer and water for Glover's Garage specific use. Um, Dylan would be installing lifts inside the garages, running his business at both 40 Main Street and Mobley. Uh, with that said, we'd like to take this time to discuss any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Questions from the board? Mr. Barry, then Mr. Richardson. Yeah. Um, so when you say site plan, what, what exactly are you proposing outside? Are, are you doing absolutely nothing and taking it as is? Yes. Okay. All right, that's pretty straightforward then. Thank you. So, so yeah, uh, I, here's, the, <laughs> here's the permit. So here's the, the permit for the previous tenant. And then we did make booklets for you all that have pictures of the building as it stands today, uh, as well as a hand sketched uh, uh, measurements. The building itself is only uh, 1,200 square feet. Um, so do you have any intention of doing any work outside? Like, do you foresee there being any, any fluid, uh, any, anything that could ease, uh, drain onto the ground? Because remember, right behind, we have the canal. So we don't want to discharge any pollutants into our water system. No, there's going to be no work going on outside. Um, never, uh, unless it's the jump started to get it in. Um, that'd be the only thing. Um. Okay. Mr. Richardson? Yeah, uh, thank you for, you mentioned that you would probably have maybe five cars parked there. And so I guess my question is, are you looking to work on cars by or vehicles by appointment or drop in or the the one thing i noticed in, in a number and i call them you got a minute cars you know people drive up you got a minute i need you to look at this and can i leave it and people do and then the next thing you know you see cars all over the place and, and that kind of bothers me because you know it, it fills up a, a parking area very quickly when people do that and so if you're talking about five cars or so at a time, I'm more than happy with that. So I don't know if you want to address the got a minute cars. Um, yeah, so my plan is to keep it by appointment because um, where I do on the road stuff, I'll probably be doing um, my mobile thing three, three plus days a week. Um, I work with a lot of construction companies right now. so. I, I would probably mainly be on the road and just use that as like a, you know, um, keep tools that I can't keep on my truck and um, things of that nature. It's it's more of like a, a regroup, refuel, you know, kind of situation. And I'd be working on things that um, would be tougher to do with just jacks and jack stands. Um, that would be nice with a lift. Um, but yeah, definitely no, I, nobody's stopping in. Uh, yeah, I don't like that either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Actually, the property kind of returns to his roots. It used to be Paul's Amico gas station and car repair facility back in the Stone Age. Uh, yeah. So you're actually reviving a, a previous use. Uh, any other questions from the board? 
uh, Mr. Rhodes. Um, so you mentioned in your statement that you, you're you qualified on heavy equipment as well, heavy diesel construction equipment, rail, rail cars, things like that. Um, is your intent on this site to keep work that occurs here to small automotive, or are you looking to do heavy equipment here as well? Um, just small automotive. Okay. Um, yeah, nothing. Yeah, there won't be any excavators or dump trucks. <laughs> okay. I, I was just concerned about the that road being particularly across from the library, the impact of heavy equipment on the the pavement, on the fact that you've got the canal right there. If this is automotive only, I think you're using this for what it's meant to be. Mr. Horton. Well, I'll say, just say congratulations, Mr. Glover, on you know your business and all your hard work to get here. Uh, I, for one, kind of have a different view on it. I think, uh, you know, our downtown's changing, changing for the better. A lot of good stuff going on, and, you know, there's a lot of new restaurants, or there, there are new restaurants. The police station just sold, and, and their plan is to have a small playground for kids there with additional restaurant and some additional housing. So I don't, I don't exactly, I don't see this really fitting in my, pers my personal opinion. I don't really see it fitting with the... Uh, the vibe of the downtown right now, yeah, you know, I kind of just see it changing with the additional with the pediatric dentist across the street too. So I'm not, I'm not real sold on the, uh, on the uh, car repair facility. You know, there's a lot of great spaces that this would, would do serve you well. Um, you know, like 108 being one of them, you know, more of that commercial industrial area. So um, that's just one board member's opinion though. So I'm not, I'm not super sold on the car repair. But I wish you the best, though. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Mr. Abram. I like the idea, and <clears throat> congratulations on trying to uh, accomplish this. But uh, the concern I have is uh, when you're doing repairs, are you going to be doing any type of maintenance repair and hazmat removal and spillage and oil water separators, if, if that may be needed for this project? Uh, yes, I take the environment very seriously. I know waste oil is its not pleasant to look at, no matter where it is. Um, so right now, um, I take my oil to um, the shop that I used to work at. They burn it, um, and then they take the used antifreeze, and they have a company remove it. Um, and I would plan to do the same thing, uh, just keep bringing it there. Um, Are you going to have a uh, waste oil burner slash heating system inside the facility, or is it? Um, no, they do, they do at their facility, um, so I'll just keep bringing my oil there, um, but I won't have anything, uh, I'll probably have like a 55 gallon drum, keep it in there and then we'll swap them. Okay. Mr. Witham. Question for city staff first. So. Not a permitted use according to our regulations, but we can permit the use with a conditional use permit versus uh, going to the zoning board uh, and seeking relief there. Is that correct? Correct. Which is why we're having this conversation here. Correct. So, <clears throat> so when it comes to the conditional use permit process, I think it requires us to be very thoughtful, not only of the applicant, who I think would do a, a tremendous job based upon your delivery of the information here tonight, but of what the overall desire of the downtown is, where this is located, uh, as Mr. Horton spoke. And I'm not sure that automobile repair fits anymore. Now that being said, it was a former repair facility. If you look at the picture, it looks like an automobile repair facility. Can we hide an automobile repair facility in plain sight, right? And I think a lot of that depends. And what does it depend on? What does the property ultimately look like? I can just share with you that prior tenants of this property were uh, the, the bane of existence of our code enforcement officer with various compliance issues because we don't want visible dumpsters. We don't want cars up on jack stands. We don't want, again, we get what the building looks like, but we don't want it to look like 
quite frankly, there are some automobile repair facilities in this community that don't look too good, right? Uh, there are junk cars, there's leaf springs outside, there's barrels of this, that, and the other thing. It's not particularly well kept. So I'm not saying I would support this, but if I were to support this, you're going to have to have a lot in the application that speaks to limiting on-site parking, uh, delineating the parking, uh, talk about dumpsters. Uh, uh, again, there's no landscaping right now. It's a, it's a canvas of hot top and concrete. But could we put some planters or something? Could we dress? That's going to help me to get there because I'm not there just yet uh, because I don't think it fits. But it could. I know that's not terribly helpful, but that's where I'm at. It's, it's helpful. No, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have one comment. I guess, I guess my point is you already have a car repair facility n next door, so it kind of fits in that area. Uh, that's my comment, Mr. Rhodes. So I think Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Whitten bring up some good concerns here, and it is part of a downtown that we're looking to revitalize. It is one that has had some motion in that direction lately in particular. Um, I do want to raise the point here that this has been in the past a car repair facility, um, and at one point it sounds like a gas station, although that predates my time in Summersworth. Um, it was recently used for a, a flooring. I thought it was a bath refitting company at one point, too. Um, either way, that kind of semi-industrial sort of, of usage here. The points that Mr. Wenham raises about dressing this up and making it fit better with the revitalizing downtown do make sense to me, and I think they're ones that we should consider when this comes in. I do just want to caution the board against letting the perfect be the enemy of the good here as well. If we're looking to have this be something other than an auto repair facility, we'd be talking, or something similar to that, that semi-industrial use, we'd be talking about asking the landowners to basically demolish this building in the hopes that something less industrial could be built on the site. I would much rather have an auto repair facility that puts some effort into its appearance than a vacant building in the hope that it could be some sort of boutique commercial at some point in the undefined future. So that middle point of let this be an auto shop, but put in some planners, keep your lot clean, present a good face to the town, um, and the passers-by, I think, would be a good use for this site. Any other comments from the board? I'd just like to reiterate what Mr. Rhodes said, and you pretty much summarize uh, my thoughts. Yeah, no further well, comments. Th yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, to, to be f to, uh, frank, we'd be very amenable to making it look nice. You know, the current owner bought the property to store a vehicle. Their needs have changed. So, you know, they're trying to, again, take it from, you know, basically a vacant building to something that is more in line with you know, the vision of the long term here of the downtown of Summersworth. So I appreciate your candor today. Thank you. And all the questions, uh, you all set with our comments? Uh, I, think, I think that's good. We're going to talk to the engineers and try to put together a uh, CUP for you guys. Look forward to seeing you back. Perfect. Can I get the use permit back? Thank you. I didn't take a photocopy of it. No, no, packets are yours. This here? Yeah. Planner Crossley, is there any new business that may come before the board? No other new business. Item 5, workshop business, solar ordinance discussion. Planner Crossley, the floor is yours. <laughs> so Director Mears did indicate that if you prefer to wait for her to return, um, you can continue this to the August meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to let you know, we did uh, share this with the Conservation Commission up on her request. They did provide some comments. If Jeremy does want to, I can review them, or if you want to review them, I'm, summarize them. I'm happy to. You've okay. had to do a lot of talking tonight, so happy to jump <laughs> in if that's okay. Um, so on conservation, a lot of our concerns here were around what could you do with a CUP under these guidelines, because 
right now it's stated that you can't put solar panels into um, wetland buffers, whether you're dealing with the, the vegetated or woodland. Um, a lot of our questions came up around, would you be allowed to with the CUP? Or is this a hard and fast, no exceptions rule? Um, we had some concerns around um, drainage from these because it does alter the manner in which water comes off. Um, you put a big solar panel in place, particularly one of the ground mount ones that just sits at an angle, you've got constant flow onto a point. Um, so we wanted to note that this would be a largely impervious use. You're channeling runoff uh, with this. Um, we also had a concern about on the uh, city-owned land component, um, whether that could involve clearance of forests that are in place on city-owned property for a temporary lease. Um, so wanted to have that looked at by uh, the planning board and, and potentially, I believe, council has to speak to this too. Um, so we are concerned about the possibility of clearance of existing vegetated and heavily vegetated land for the installation of solar farms. Uh, there's also been a couple of applicants lately that have uh, said that they believe that solar panels were a non-permanent installation. Um, and we took issue with that, particularly in cases where uh, you had to pour concrete in order to put in trackers, uh, footings, um, footings for trackers, rather, uh, or for more permanent installations on site. Um, these are long-term installations and wanted to make sure that they were treated as such in the ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Withel. I was not at the last meeting, but I did watch the rerun um, and like the conversation. And I think overall, I like where this is headed. Um, I think we need to wrap our arms around it sooner rather than later before it overruns us. Um, I see here a highlighted section that talks about an accessory use within the rear or side setback in residential. Can, can we talk about what accessory use is? Can, can, can someone help me with that? I would assume that it would mean it's not the primary use in the residential district. So it's accessory to your primary use, which is your residential structure. You're not running a utility power, pl the solar um, plant. I understood. That okay. would be Fine. my interpretation of that. Got it. Um, as one planning board member, uh, I think I would be fine with not allowing freestanding solar in residential areas. R rooftop, have at it. Uh, freestanding, I think, doesn't work in a residential setting. Um, if the planning board sees other than that, I think it needs to be in the rear setback, not on a side setback. I, I think my particular concern right out of the gate is residential and then uh, whether to allow it or not. And then secondly, where we do allow it in the city, uh, I think we do need to consider it a structure, and I think it needs to be uh, within setbacks and certainly should not be allowed in a front setback at any point in time. Uh, uh, whether it's a tracker or freestanding panels like have been recently installed behind the Dunkin' Donuts on Route 108, uh, I think backyard or side yard is where those belong. They certainly don't belong in the front yard. Um, and with regard to the trackers, I'm concerned about height. Uh, I know we have a height ordinance here in the city, uh, so I think we need to be mindful of what that is. Uh, and when I think about the structure of a tracker, it's measuring from the corners of the big square that rotates down. It's not the pedestal that it sits on. So think of it as a large cube, if you will. So th those are the things that I would want to make sure that we contemplate within the ordinance. I like many of the other things in terms of, you know, uh, data plates and emergency response and all of those things. I think those make sense in here, uh, but I'm particularly concerned about, I like solar, I get the need for solar, it makes a lot of sense, but we need to be mindful of what it does to our neighbors. <coughs> Mr. Richardson and Mr. Berry. Yeah, these are the kind of issues that were talked about at our annual meeting and um, the kind of the point of that meeting was that solar is here to stay and we need to come up with some kinds of rules and regulations 
to make them applicable to our city. Uh, the issue of front yard, backyard, all of that, you know, the, the circumference of a tracker and not just the base of the tracker. And if I recall, we, we had a, uh, a proposal for uh, solar uh, some time ago where we said that, you know, the, the uh, whatever you call it, the panel couldn't, couldn't go into the neighbor's property. Um, and, you know, that kind of thing we have to be mindful of uh, to address the uh, rooftop versus the yard, you know, the kinds of things that came up with, well, you know, maybe my roof doesn't face in the right direction for solar, so why am I being discriminated against if I could have one in my yard? Well, what part of the yard? Is it visible to the neighbors? Is it visible? You know, those are the kinds of things that people have suggested, not wanting to be discriminatory against somebody who might want to benefit from uh, solar power, but just doesn't, you know, their, their rooftop, like my own, doesn't face in the right direction. So uh, it, it's the kind of thing that having regulations helps in that process, and certainly is with anything else, people can request a waiver if there are, um, you know, circumstances that they feel might might benefit themselves, um, but it's getting it done, getting getting the rules and regulations in place. Is they're here to stay, and we're going to be dealing with it. Thank you, Mr. Berry. <laughs> okay, so I, I agree completely uh, with Mr. Richardson. You know, the reality is that um, we do have to be very careful with our verbiage that we do put into our regulations. Um, you know, to, to his point, you know, yeah, maybe there's somebody out there that says, you know what, my, my roof doesn't face the right direction. Um, and it may not be financially practical, but tracker, you know, somebody might see benefit in having a tracking system, even though it would cost a fortune to do. But there could be that one person that may test us on this. Now, uh, to counter uh, Councillor Witham here, you know, we also need to be careful when we say front yard. Now, in general, I would agree 100%, never in the front yard. But there could be the opportunity, somebody might have 10 acres here in town. You know, they, could have, they might have a road that goes back half a mile into their property. So what does front yard actually mean, right? What's the city's stance for setbacks, right, if you have uh, foliage, right? So there, we might have to be very careful with how we verb uh, uh, list out our, our verbiage in our in our regs to represent those particular situations where maybe if you want to get a tracker you have to come before us anyway so regardless that's it roof mount fine deal with it local but if you're going to put in a structure planning board good discussion good scenarios to consider mr rhodes so similar comments here um regarding rooftop versus ground mount, uh, there's conditions under which rooftop can't work. One is the direction of your roof. Another one that can show up is tree cover. Uh, if you've got substantial shading over your roof line, which is good from a heating perspective, um, it can often create a situation where rooftop's just impractical on a site. You don't generate enough to make it worthwhile. Particularly when we're dealing with people who are larger landholders, um, I think ground mount can make a lot of sense for them, particularly if they've got that kind of a scenario where they've got trees around their home and then an open field behind it or in front of it even so I'd, I'd agree with mr barry that i think when we're looking at wording here for residential accessory usage um we may want to structure it around screening from road view and neighbor view as opposed to lot placement um, that way we can address the the potential uses of the property without impinging on the the quality of the the sight lines on it. Um, the other piece around accessory, uh, Ms. Wilson was completely right. These are secondary uses on the property. We've got two called out in here. One's residential, one's agricultural. It's just where your primary use on the property isn't solar power generation. It, I also want to note that we do need to get this done sooner rather than later. Um, we crossed a tipping point probably about a year or two ago with solar, where even when you take into account the subsidization of fossil production that government undertakes in this country. Solar is cheaper than that in New England. Um, this is only going to accelerate. So if we can get a well-crafted ordinance in place that, or zoning ordinance in place that 
allows it to be placed as heavily as possible while still maintaining the quality of the community, it's going to serve our community well to have that in there for both commercial and residential users. Can we find some examples from municipalities that are already f much further down the road, I would imagine, uh, than we are? Yeah. So I know Michelle pulled this from a couple of other local communities. I know she mentioned Durham, or you mentioned Durham. I forget which of you didn't. Um, a couple others that were looked at as well. It was, give me a second to give you the previous staff report. If Chris has a comment. Yeah, so I'll just, uh, just, just a quick one. So I'm just want to uh, piggyback on the, um, yes, that one. Discussion. The, uh, the screening portion. So thinking about Dunkin' Donuts, you know, they did a, they planted some extra trees and stuff there, but I think we could have gone further to uh, increase some screening there. I think it's a little bit of an eyesore. I mean, it's in a good location, so I mean, I'm glad it's not next to, I'm glad I'm not living next to it. Um, but I think if we're, if we focus on heavy screening in a residential area, I think that would be key. Mr. Witham. Yeah, I think all good comments and all things for us to consider. Now, remember that our current regulations call out what is defined as a front yard, right? So th those things are already defined. And sometimes the zoning board is challenged with like corner lots because they have two front yards, right? So uh, zoning board is a place where if you need relief for some quirky thing like the corner lot is where you go. Uh, so I, I like the mechanics that we already have in place. I think the discussion we ought to have is should we allow them by right or should it be you need to seek relief if you want to put it there, right? Um, example, you can't put a shed in your front yard. Uh, you could seek relief if that was the only place that you could put a shed on your property. So uh, I, I think that's a mechanism we already have in place and, and might consider it. Uh, I do like what has been mentioned about screening if we are to allow it in residential areas uh, beyond rooftop uh, it must be screened which says to me pretty quickly that the idea of a solar tracker is going to be hard to screen so maybe it's a ground mounted uh, type of thing so screening might be the way to go versus an outright don't allow it uh, if someone has enough land and I challenge you to find that within our small 10 square miles here uh, where you could put it uh, behind some very large vegetated buffer uh, that no one's going to see it. Uh, have at it, right? So uh, I like the idea of screening. I think that might make sense uh, in a residential area. I think it's tough to do in a commercial area, possible maybe, but throw those out. Yeah, I agree with the screening, but we could, I think we should also define what type of screening, height, width, to cover or hide the uh, panels. To that end, you know, on, in our site plan regulations, if a developer has rooftop HVAC units, uh, they can't be visible from certain sight lines. So maybe to keep our language consistent, uh, I think it's at like a six foot elevation from the edge of road type of thing. So There's maybe also um, about parking lots that are adjacent to public right of ways. It talks about screening for those to be a certain opacity. So again, I think we already have some language that we might as well stay consistent with. So uh, I hear you. Any further discussion? Uh -huh. Mr. Orton? Uh, so in your, uh, we didn't touch on it yet, but in your packet or on the desk tonight, there was a uh, survey uh, for housing. And uh, I'll just add that um, I saw it. So with the workshop? Yeah. With the workshop are we going to get to that um it's outside of the solar ordinance um if anyone has we did um for a follow-up we did take from barrington dover um, durham and rochester um, and the state model for solar i didn't know if you guys had any other further solar comments that you wanted to loop in um but otherwise we can incorporate things that you guys have mentioned and bring michelle will discuss it with you again in august if that works for board and then um, we did provide a memo that Chris will address it sounds like sorry about that I no, thought we're fine. I thought we were good with solar so yeah so um, so saw some statistics communications and miscellaneous yeah 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 2014, the uh, medium home, the medium rental uh, price for um, an apartment here in the city, in the state, was around 1150. It's now up to 2,000 for medium uh, apartment rental, and uh, with a, a vacancy rate of 0.6 percent. So uh, it's pretty challenging out there. You know, if you're uh, looking for a place to rent, thankfully I'm not. But uh, you know, we had some uh, pretty pretty big projects before us in the last couple few months. So um, I mean, uh, we see it here. You know, there's always uh, butters that come out to. Uh, to voice their concerns with it, but uh, I think, you know, just as a board and as a community, we need to focus and uh, maintain that, uh, you know, housing is, is critical to the community, to the region, and all that. So initially, what I was getting at was uh, on the city website, there is a, uh, a survey you can go do and complete, and uh, we're working with, Mark and I are working with the uh, Stratford Regional Planning Commission on, uh, as well as the planning department to update the, uh, the housing chapter of the master plan. Anything to add, Dana? Um, no, that was great. Um, so hopefully everyone has taken the survey. If they haven't, please do tell your friends. Councilor Witherman, it looks like you haven't. <laughs> um, also, we are going to have a housing forum um, in September on the 14th. It's a Thursday at the Black Box Theater. We hope everyone can attend. People, um, general public, we're looking for we're looking for having conversation about housing, and it's an opportunity to have more intercourt um, discussion with people about housing. So, please take the survey. Now, now any of these housing advocates, uh, are they getting towns like Northampton, Hampton Falls, Rye? I think it's the five towns they said that have the most restrictive. Uh, A lot of is, yeah. Where, where it always seems to be like. Put on sums with Dover, Rochester, yeah. as far as, gee, you're doing enough for housing with these <laughs> towns, you know. A lot of communities are looking at housing. Um, yeah. And we participated in the Spring Housing Academy, which um, had a lot of different communities. I don't recall um, about those specific ones, but a lot of them are looking at how to address housing in their communities to provide it reasonably for what they are able like to provide. Like is the town of Newcastle looking for ways to vary their housing opportunities? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I guess that's my question. They, could, they have some large parts, uh, structures, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Mr. Woodham. You know, it's, it's all an interesting conversation, and I will do the survey, and uh, pending availability, we'll go to the, uh, to the session as well. Uh, these are important conversations, you know, and, and some of it was ginned up at the last city council meeting with the uh, Chinberg development proposal for the armory. And, you know, one of the questions that was asked, and I think it's, it's an interesting question, uh, is why is there a need for all of these apartments? And if you look at Summersworth's population today versus 10 years ago versus 50 years ago, pretty stable. If you were to chart it over the course of 100 years, Summersworth's population is pretty flat, right? Yeah, it's had ebbs and flows, and, but it's pretty flat. So why is there a need for all of this housing? And I think the simple answer, it, it's sort of my simple answer, is that the housing unit today is different than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, heck, when I was in high school back in the early 1980s, I went to school with many kids that were from families of six, seven, eight, ten, right? Uh, the family unit today is one, maybe two kids. If there's kids, many are one person, two people. So it's the same number of people, but it's, it's a bunch of, it's more blocks that you have to find homes for. So it's the, the number may be the same, but the way it's divided is radically different today, which means you need more housing units. And with such a lack of housing, uh, it's a supply demand issue, right? Uh, you can get those high rents when you have, what, less than 1% vacancy, right? Oh, I guess I can ask what I want. That's how it works, right? It's not complicated uh, in, it, in the way that the number is arrived at, but solving it is. Mr. Richardson? Yeah, the, the survey addresses that kind of an issue, and, you know, I, I think we've seen with our, with our census figures 
from 2020 and our school population down considerably. Um, just exactly what you're saying. Our, 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 our housing needs have changed from families to individuals or couples, uh, seniors who are no longer living with their families, that kind of thing. Um, so the, the, the survey certainly gives people the opportunity to say what their needs are, but what they would like to see what they think the needs, what they personally think the needs of housing are in the city, whether it's family housing, whether it's the workforce housing, however we define that, uh, whether it's moderate income, however we find that, or low income housing, you know, whatever people feel the need is, uh, or market rate housing, you know, whatever the people feel that they think summer's worth needs, th the survey gives you that opportunity. Um, and I would recommend that people fill it out. Um, it doesn't take long. The, um, uh, the plan is to go, you know, to have a community forum at the black box uh, on Thursday, right? That, yeah, I, <laughs> I knew it was coming up, but I've been really busy lately and hadn't looked oh. at my calendar. So thank you for that. Our meeting, Mark, you mean? Hmm? You mean our meeting? Yes. That's Friday. Okay. This will be on a Thursday for a public forum. The, the one but in the black box. That's what I'm talking yep. about. Yeah. Yes. So that's, that's an opportunity for people to come in and uh, get their opinions known as well. So it, it's a good thing to discuss you know, what other communities are doing, uh, whatever their regional planning commissions are doing. That's up to them. But this is something that Summersworth has chosen to do, and it's a good thing for everybody. Any other comments? Again, I'd like to uh, welcome Mr. Haberman to the board. Hopefully you had a informative night. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Mr. Witham, seconded by Mr. Rhodes. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you.